So hello everyone, my name is Lizzie Stewart and we are pleased that all of you could join us for this week's lecture in volume nine of the No Neuropsychology Didactic Series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. This series was created by early career, uh, by trainees and early career neuropsychologists, including standing members of the No Neuropsychology Board, as well as members of the No Neuropsychology Committee. We would like to thank our 2024 sponsors for their generous financial support of this series. And before we start our goal, one of the main, or before we start our lecture, one of the main goals of No Neuropsychology is to provide free, high quality didactic content to our audience. Every No Neuropsychology and No Neuroanatomy lecture is available on our YouTube channel. Be sure to check it out, subscribe, and like our lectures to get first access to new content. New to Know Neuropsychology is our collaboration with APPCN to bring you learning and discussion questions that are provided with specific lectures content. You can, uh, you can access these on our website through APPCN. Here are our disclaimers for this series. This training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box in the lower left of your screen, and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website and YouTube channel later this week. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Twomley for today's lecture titled Comp Compensatory Cognitive Training, CogSmart for Neuropsychiatric Conditions. Dr. Twomley is a neuropsychologist and professor of psychiatry at UC San Diego. Much of her work is based in the VA San Diego healthcare system, where she is a VA rehabilitation research and development research career scientist and the director of clinical research unit and the, of the Center of Excellence for Stress and Mental Health. Dr. Twomley's research has focused on cognitive training and other interventions to improve real world functioning for individuals with severe mental illnesses, traumatic brain injuries, MCI, and other cognitive impairments. She developed the Compensatory Cognitive Training, CCT, and Cognitive Symptoms Management and Rehabilitation Therapy, COGSMART, with funding from NIH, the VA, the Department of Defense, the NSF, BBRF, NARSAD, and UC San Diego grants. These treatment manuals and other clinical materials are available at no charge on her website, COGSMART.com. And with that, Dr. Twomley, I'll turn it over to you. Okie dokie. Thank you so much. And I'll share my screen here and start the presentation. All right. Well, first of all, I just want to say thanks so much to No Neuropsychology for having me today. It's really a pleasure to be with you. And um, I'm here to talk about compensatory cognitive training and COGSMART for neuropsychiatric conditions. I don't have any disclosures, just some pretty pictures of where I work. And I wanted to start out the talk today by just sharing some common cognitive strategies that people use. So maybe you can think about um, whether these are some of the things that you use to be successful. So a place to keep all of your important stuff, uh, written reminders for you to take things with you when you leave the house, perhaps. Some people like to use something like this. Um, that's okay. And this version is okay too. Uh, a lot of us like to-do lists, makes us feel good to check things off. Uh, Post-it notes to remind ourselves to do things also can be very useful. I would not recommend uh, this version, not helpful. Um, and of course, some people like to do the electronic version of this, and that's great too. In terms of remembering medications, many of us might use something like this, a pill box, there are even fancier versions that have alarm clocks on them. And of course, the um, apps that help you uh, remember to take medications. And the reason that I bring all these things up is that, you know, whenever I give this talk, everybody says, oh, well, yeah, we, we couldn't uh, live our lives without some of these compensatory strategies. But a few years ago, I turned uh, some of the interventions into an app. It's called the CogSmart app. And this is just a screenshot of the dashboard, but um, I don't get a whole lot of uh, backend data from the app, but I do get de-identified um, counts of, 
of whether people are willing to give some of these strategies a try. And so with every strategy that we introduce, we ask, are you already doing this? Or if not, are you willing to try it or not? And um, I just wanna show you some of the uh, backend data that I get from that. So these were the answers to, will you try using a calendar? And you can see that about 50% of the users are in gray and they're saying they already use a calendar. And then most of the other folks are willing to give it a try. Very rarely they'll say no to that. And then um, here's the data for, will you try writing things down to remember them later? And you see about a third of uh, respondents are already using that strategy. So this was really eye-opening to me to realize that half the folks out there um, are not using a calendar and only about a third are writing things down to remember them. So what this tells us is basically we, we can't assume that our clients use all the same skills that we do. And some of these very basic skills that um, folks use every day to be successful may never have been taught to them or may not be mastered, or um, they may have used them in the past, but they're not currently using them. Uh, so I think really asking clients how they use the skills and then having them show you is super essential. And I'll probably come back to that point a little bit later in the talk, but I always like to start off with this because these are very basic uh, things that we teach clients to do. And, and we just can't assume that they're already using those. Okay, so here's the rest of the talk. I'll talk about the uh, rationale for Cogsmart and CCT um, and how those were developed. I'll give you some results from the previous studies. And then I'll give you, if you're interested um, in using this clinically and you haven't tried it yet, I'll give you some sort of um, tips and tricks to get started. So first let's talk about the development. And I want you to keep in mind that um, there are really three pillars of health. So we've got physical health, mental health, and cognitive health. And oftentimes cognitive health is not given as much attention uh, by clinicians, but it's equally important for functioning. And it really means a lot to people. And so we know that all of the neuropsychiatric disorders that we treat, you know, these are brain disorders and they have cognitive consequences. So whether you're talking about um, severe mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or major depression, PTSD, um, or an acquired brain injury or mild cognitive impairment, uh, really regardless, we would expect to see some sort of cognitive decline, if not impairment, um, even in the psychiatric illnesses, because the brain is really trying to keep those psychiatric symptoms under control, and it doesn't have enough resources to be as efficient as it might be. Um, so that's really why we need to focus on treating these cognitive impairments. When you have cognitive impairments or declines, uh, the role functioning um, outcomes are really, are really impaired as well. And so people have dif difficulty with independent living, um, with working up to their potential, meeting their education goals, um, having successful social relationships. And that can lead to decreased quality of life um, and disability. And so we really need to focus on cognitive impairments to improve uh, role functioning and, and life satisfaction. Okay, so in my lab over the last um, 20 to 25 years, we've focused on developing these manuals. Um, so one of them is called compensatory cognitive training. The other one's called CogSmart. They're really similar. So I want you to think of this as like a family of interventions. Um, I'll show you more specifics later, but in general, we have found um, through many randomized controlled trials that these interventions have positive effects on uh, untrained cognitive performance tests. So using standard neuropsychological tests, they have effects on psychiatric uh, symptom severity. In the case of TBI, also on post-concussive symptoms. And they generally have um, large effects on quality of life. These are some of the trials that we've done in San Diego. You can see a bunch of different populations. And then there have also been a lot of um, 
uh, translations all over the world. Uh, this is what happens when you give things away for free, people use it. And so it's been translated into a lot of different languages. Uh, some of those are listed here. Uh, and there have been some international trials focusing on various populations. The manuals have been downloaded uh, many, many times and are in use in many healthcare systems. Uh, the app went live about five years ago. And um, next steps include combining these interventions with other efficacious interventions to treat neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, and I'm also working on some exciting uh, steps to integrate these interventions with robotics that I'll show you in a little bit. <clears throat> so in general, there are a couple different approaches to cognitive training. Uh, there's the restorative approach, which really focuses on restoring impaired uh, neural circuitry through typically computerized um, drill and practice exercises, um, lots of uh, sort of cognitive games. These are really portable. You can do them at home. They're um, easy to administer. And, and they definitely do something. They, they do work. Um, and, and they've been shown to be effective for, for improving multiple different types of outcomes. The problem with these has always been it's been really hard for them to show generalizability to uh, everyday functioning outcomes. Uh, so that's that's been the issue with those types of interventions. And then on the other hand, uh, we've got the compensatory interventions, which are really not intended to restore impaired neural circuitry, but really intended to work around cognitive problems. These can be done um, in individuals or groups, uh, but it's usually done by a provider. And so it's it's a bit more costly to do it. These uh, types of interventions across different populations have generally shown um, better functional outcomes. And so you probably have guessed that I'm more a proponent of the compensatory approach. And so we really use um, this aspect of cognitive compensation in all of the interventions. And then the other really important piece of it is habit learning. So. Um, so we know that habits are particularly resistant to forgetting. Um, anybody who brushed their teeth or had a cup of coffee this morning probably knows that. And they use um, neostriatal pathways instead of uh, traditional declarative memory pathways in the brain. And so those tend to be a little bit more intact um, for many neuropsychiatric groups. All right, so these are some examples of some of the restorative approaches that you may have heard of. Um, Lumosity is uh, very heavily advertised, for example, on NPR. So you've probably heard of that one. Um, it's a real um, game-like, you know, sort of gamified cognitive exercise program. And the one that probably has the most um, research evidence to, to um, back it up is the Brain HQ uh, from Posit Science. But there are other ones for certain um, conditions. This one uh, called circuits is for schizophrenia and, and so on. Okay, so why do I like this compensatory approach? Uh, the first reason is that the cause of the cognitive impairments is not particularly important. You're providing a workaround um, that really has the potential to induce brain plasticity um, in the end, because when you do things differently, your brain actually changes. And so by, by using these different strategies, you can actually induce brain plasticity. This is an extremely recovery oriented type of intervention. Uh, we focus on goals and roles in the community a lot. Um, and everyone uses compensatory strategies. So you can really sort of destigmatize the approach. You don't have to call it therapy. You can call it a class instead. We know that habits and routines are powerful. And finally, the last reason I like it is that there's evidence of improvement in uh, both cognition and other functional outcomes. So in terms of these interventions uh, that we've developed in my lab, they're generally administered once a week for um, eight or 12 weeks. We've done this both uh, with individuals and in groups. And there's a manual to each one. And so um, the facilitators would have a copy of the manual. All the service users would have a copy of the manual. Everyone's on the same page. Very low tech. You can do this anywhere. We've done it in coffee shops, libraries, and so on. 
And even if we're doing a group, we do have an individualized approach within that group that really talks about each person's cognitive problems, um, specific rehabilitation goals, and then links the strategies that we're teaching to each person's goals. <clears throat> we do um, homework every week. And I just learned at our last INS um, uh, conference in New York that I think I wanna start calling this brain work because I think that's a better name. Um, and then finally, we also have this uh, CogSmart app that can be used as an adjunct to these interventions. So when we developed the app, we filmed a bunch of uh, videos. They're all hosted on YouTube, so you can look them up separately, um, even without signing up for the app. Uh, but it's just a little mobile uh, web-based app, um, pretty straightforward, and it, it just demonstrates how to use all these strategies. So that can be an, a nice adjunct to the in-person treatment. Oh, we've also done it in, in telehealth too. Okay, so these are the four domains that we focus on. So first is perspective memory. And we put that one first because we want people to come back to the second session, right? So perspective memory is remembering to do things in the future. And then we move on to conversational and task attention, and then learning and memory, and then finally executive functioning and cognitive flexibility. So these are four domains that are important for everyday functioning in a variety of populations. Um, and also there was some evidence that they were modifiable. So that's why we included those. These are just some of the examples of compensatory strategies included in each domain. Um, people always ask if you could only do one, what would you do? And I always say calendars. So calendars are really important. We use them heavily in the perspective memory module. Uh, we also teach a variety of conversation skills and self-talk for conversational and task attention. And then in the, in the verbal learning and memory module, we, um, we have basically two types of strategies that we teach. So one is focused on reducing the amount of information that needs to be remembered. And the other is making the information more uh, meaningful or salient, so it's more likely to be remembered. And then finally, for executive functioning, we teach uh, brainstorming as part of a six-step problem-solving method, and we also have some content on planning. Many of the interventions also include a fair amount of focus on stress reduction, because we know that increased stress leads to cognitive failures, um, and then that tends to be a, a vicious circle and we wanna interrupt that cycle. All right, so now I'm gonna show you some of the results from previous studies, focusing first on um, the first population that I worked with, which was uh, people with psychosis and severe mental illness. So this first study um, was a six month randomized controlled trial of compensatory cognitive training versus treatment as usual for outpatients with psychosis. And in this one, we found significant um, CCT improvements in attention, memory, functional capacity, negative symptoms, and quality of life. Um, and I do wanna point out that these improvements in attention and memory were on untrained neuropsychological tests. Uh, there was also a small, um, just very short three-month pilot RCT of a group-based cognitive training versus treatment as usual in individuals with first episode schizophrenia. This was done in Canada, and they found significant CCT effects on uh, global cognition. This was measured by the matrix consensus cognitive battery for people who are familiar with that. And it was really driven by improvements in both processing speed and social cognition. I then did a, a very large study. This was an R01 with 153 um, outpatients with severe mental illnesses. They were all unemployed and seeking work. And so they were enrolled in this trial. It was a two year trial where everyone got supported employment for up to two years. And during the first 12 weeks of the trial, they were randomized to either receive uh, CCT or enhanced supported employment, which was just extra sessions of supported employment. 
And in this one, we found significant CCT associated improvements in working memory, depressive symptoms, and quality of life. In terms of uh, TBI, this work got started uh, when veterans from uh, the post 9-11 conflict started coming back with TBIs and there was just really nothing uh, available for them. And so we uh, adapted the manual for this population, um, have done a few randomized controlled trials. And I just wanna summarize um, these effects to say that we've found um, small to medium effects on uh, untrained neuropsychological tests. You can see them there on the lower left. So things like digit span, um, HVLT for learning, and letter fluency as an executive function test. We found larger effects on post-concussive symptoms, uh, prospective memory performance, and quality of life. One of the exciting things in this field has been the ability to um, work with others and start bundling um, the CCT interventions with other efficacious interventions. And this was an example of that. Um, so what we did here with Amy Jack's group was we bundled um, some CCT content in with a gold standard PTSD treatment called cognitive processing therapy or CPT. Um, so in this study, uh, everyone got CPT, um, but we had a smart CPT version that included um, the CogSmart strategies for organization, attention, memory, and planning, as well as some um, enhancements to the manual to make it a little bit easier to follow. Um, and so this was a pretty large study, 100 veterans with TBI and PTSD enrolled in this study. And what we found was that um, both groups did very well in terms of their PTSD symptom outcomes. That's not surprising because they both got a gold standard PTSD treatment. But we also found objective cognitive improvements in the SMART CPT group. And so the graphs on the right show you um, these different areas. The solid line is the SMART CPT group. And so you're seeing um, steeper uh, slopes of performance improvement and attention, verbal learning, verbal memory, as well as uh, novel problem solving on the Wisconsin card sorting test. Okay, more recent work has been uh, with unstably housed veterans who have mental health conditions. And I probably don't need to convince you that this is a huge national problem that really needs some solutions. So <clears throat> the Housing and Urban Development has published these numbers showing that over 650,000 people experienced homelessness on an, any given night in 2023. And of those over 35,000 were veterans. So this is a problem uh, across the board, but uh, specifically in veterans and certainly the VA has devoted a large amount of money to um, trying to solve this problem. So these individuals have complex health care needs, lots of physical and mental health comorbidities, as well as cognitive impairment. They have lots of risk factors for cognitive impairment. So high rates of traumatic brain injury history, uh, high rates of psychiatric illness, substance abuse, and lots of medical conditions um, that interact with severe psychosocial stress and marginalization. So we've done some work showing that cognitive impairment is common in this population, occurring in up to 80% of individuals who are homeless. And when you have cognitive impairment, it really interferes with your ability to sustain work, which would help you sustain income to support your housing, um, as well as, as just navigating the complex social systems uh, that you need to, to get uh, additional supports. So we really think that cognition may be a barrier to ending homelessness. <coughs> so this study, was um, a, a VA merit study, and we enrolled 79 unstably housed post-9-11 veterans who had mental health conditions 
uh, and they were receiving mental health care in a residential treatment facility. All of these individuals had had cognitive impairments, so they were all scoring below, uh, you know, one standard deviation below the mean on at least one neuropsychological test, and they were randomized to either receive CCT or an education control condition for 10 weeks. <clears throat> so what did we find? Um, the CCT participants had greater improvements in attention and vigilance. This was on the um, MCCB as well, which is a really nice little battery that I like for um, more than just people with schizophrenia. So you can see in, in blue, the CCT group is improving on their attention and vigilance T-score over time. The HCE group, this was the holistic cognitive education group, they improved a little bit too. So that gives you a sense that there's some practice effect, but you see the much steeper slope of improvement in the CCT group. Uh, the CCT group also declined significantly in their um, reported neurobehavioral symptoms. So this is on the neurobehavioral symptom inventory, a very common um, gold standard instrument used to measure post-concussive symptoms. Um, and then finally, uh, in this one, <laughs> our uh, holistic cognitive education control participants actually demonstrated more improvement than the CCT participants in um, processing speed. Uh, however, we're kind of wondering if some of the CCT participants started to prioritize accuracy over speed, and maybe that's why they didn't do so well. So still looking into that finding. Moving on to another very interesting neuropsychiatric disorder, hoarding disorder. Um, this is work done with my colleagues, Dr. Catherine Ayers and Dr. Jessica Zakshevsky. And um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with hoarding disorder, uh, it's really characterized by um, inability to discard possessions until the clutter volume in the home becomes overwhelming and it compromises the functioning of the home. And it's actually one of the most prevalent psychiatric conditions. So there's about two and a half percent of people who develop this um, condition at some point in their lifetime and almost 6% prevalence over the age of 55. So it is more common in older people. And it's a highly impairing condition. These folks are at increased risk of falls in their home due to the clutter, um, fires in the home, lots of family discord, social isolation. Um, eviction rates are also very high. And they tend to have higher rates of medical and psychiatric comorbidities as well and worse quality of life than many other psychiatric conditions. They also tend to have some mild cognitive impairments in attention, visual processing, and executive functioning. So what we did was bundled uh, about seven sessions of CCT, focusing on the areas that you see here. Um, planning, prioritizing, problem solving, cognitive flexibility, and organization. These were bundled um, together and then followed by 17 to 19 weeks of exposure therapy. <clears throat> and the exposure is really exposure to the process of discarding and sorting items. And in, an, in the initial randomized control trial um, that was published a few years ago, um, we showed actually- I found this on the web. Yeah, my watch is talking to me. Um, we showed that there were similar um, symptom improvements in uh, both the CREST group, this was the bundle treatment, versus a case management control condition. So this SIR score is the savings inventory revised. That's sort of a gold standard measure of hoarding symptom severity. And this red line that you see in the graph um, shows um, a, a, a symptomatic level. And so you can see that the crust group in gray um, declined um, faster and uh, further and got to a sub symptomatic level of hoarding symptoms. Um, so, so both groups did, uh, did improve, but the crust group improved in their symptoms a little bit more 
and um, their functioning also improved more in the crest group. We also found significant associated effects of crest on uh, inhibition. This was measured by the DCEFs color word inhibition switching um, subscale score and um, switching on verbal fluency switching. Uh, I always say a, a picture is worth a thousand words and this was uh, <laughs> true in this case. This is just one uh, participant in that study picture of her bedroom at the initial home visit. And you can see that um, there is a bed under there, but it's not usable because of all the possessions. And by session 18, you can see that the room is still quite cluttered. There are a lot of items in it, um, but the, the usability of the room has been restored. Okay? And that was something that we saw pretty consistently in that study. So that led to another study, and I'll go through these rather quickly. Um, this was a larger study, and I just want to point out this was the CREST intervention compared to an exposure only, so a much more robust control condition, and we're about to see uh, what that did. And so in this uh, study, we found very similar uh, trajectories of improvement in that SIR score, that um, savings inventory revised total score, measuring hoarding symptom severity. And so both groups got to a subsyndromal level of symptoms, which was great. They're both getting exposure therapy. And so exposure therapy does work quite well in, in terms of improving hoarding symptoms. And there was no difference between the groups um, in terms of their hoarding symptoms. Where we did see some differences was in terms of uh, functioning. And so this is the specific level of functioning scale. It has several subscales in it. And you can see in the graph on the right that the CREST group is improving over time um, and, and even improving a little bit past the post-treatment period, whereas the um, exposure therapy only group is staying uh, rather flat in terms of their functioning. This was really driven by some improvements in uh, work skills specifically, as well as improvements in interpersonal relationship skills. In terms of cognitive performance, uh, we do see practice effects uh, in both groups, of course, um, but we see that the CREST group improved um, even more in terms of their DCAF's design fluency switching, so a nice measure of cognitive flexibility, as well as um, their uh, processing speed on DCAF's uh, trails. All right, moving on a little bit to mild cognitive impairment in older adults. Uh, this is a study that's going on right now. In fact, um, we're having our very last session of our very last group uh, this Wednesday. And so it's wrapping up and I'll, uh, next time I come talk to you, I'll have some results from this study. But what we did here was adapt CCT for older adults with MCI. Uh, it's a shorter intervention, so this one is only eight weeks long, and it's this is a group-based intervention, and we added in a lot of content about um, modifiable protective factors to protect cognition in older age. So <clears throat> uh, we included mindfulness-based stress reduction strategies and brief motivational interviewing to um, improve healthy lifestyle choices. So for example, physical activity, uh, Mediterranean diet, um, and so on. This was a, a two-site study. Um, the VA San Diego and the VA in Portland were the two sites. And we uh, enrolled 167 older veterans with MCI into this study and compared this uh, motivationally enhanced CCT to a goal setting group, which is actually a very, very robust control condition. People really love the goal setting group and they tend to do well in it. So this, um, I don't have results from, from the VA merit study yet because we're not done yet, but um, this manual was used in, a, in another study. And uh, this slide is, is adapted from one that was just recently 
presented at the INS meeting. Um, so in this uh, study, the authors enrolled 28 individuals in an open label trial of MECCT. And, and this just highlights that this was highly feasible and acceptable um, to these uh, service users. Only 6% of their sample um, didn't want to do the study because it was a telehealth study. And of the ones who did enroll, uh, 24 out of 28 completed the treatment. They actually adapted it to be six weeks instead of eight, so it was even briefer. Um, and the dropouts were really not to do with any telehealth issues. They were mostly health-related issues that came up. And in this study, uh, again, this is open label, so no control group, but individuals did report increased use of cognitive strategies. They also reported more cognitive failures. <laughs> and we think that's because they're just doing better error monitoring um, by the time they've uh, focused on their cognition for six weeks. But overall, it was very feasible. Um, very few um, issues with interference from technical difficulties. So this could be a really scalable um, type of intervention that could, could really reach into um, rural uh, populations, other diverse populations, uh, people who lack transportation or are homebound. Um, so, so we really think that this telehealth um, adaptation might be uh, helpful in the future. Okay, and then uh, we've also taken the um, MECCT content and developed a robot. And so this is, is work um, done in collaboration with Laurel Rick and her lab at UCSD and funded by a grant from NSF. And so these are some uh, pictures of the types of robots that we've used. The um, one on the right is sort of the most recent iteration. So we used this, um, this cute little one on the left initially, um, but it didn't, it didn't have all of the <clears throat> features that we were looking for. And, and uh, we had a lot of feedback from service users saying what they wanted. And they wanted something that was a little bit more human-like, but not super human-like. And so we came up with this one. Um, but then the, the shirt just didn't really work out. So we ended up taking that off. And so this is what the robot is looking like in its current iteration. And the idea here is that, um, you know, we teach folks these skills in a clinical setting, but we really want them to reinforce those skills and practice in their own environment. And so this has been um, developed over time with our veterans and presented um, several times at the HRI conference. Okay, um, one of the things that I always do is ask our participants what they think of these interventions. And so I, I won't read all of these quotes, but I do just wanna point out this, this one at the bottom in the middle. So this was a gentleman who had schizophrenia and diabetes. And he said he went from not checking his sugars daily, maybe every other day, or he would skip a few days, to checking every day or twice a day. And he would write his glucose levels down in his calendar. And then he would have a month's worth of glucose control data to show to his physician. This was something that we never told him to do. We didn't come up with this idea. He learned the strategy and ran with it. And I've just, I've heard similar stories so many times of people adapting these strategies for things that are important in their own lives. And it's just so inspiring um, to see the, these kinds of outcomes. All right, so I've told you so far that we've got um, some nice effects of these interventions on untrained neuropsychological tests, symptom measures in various populations, We've shown improvements in uh, functioning, functional capacity, quality of life, and so on. And when we combine these interventions with uh, other therapeutic interventions, we do see some additional benefits without really seeing that we're um, diluting the uh, efficacy of the original intervention. So I think really the opportunities here are to improve the durability 
of Cogsmart and CCT to measure uh, further out from treatment to see if these effects last, to increase the personalization of these treatments and also to improve the reach of these treatments into diverse populations. So some new directions that are aiming to do exactly those things. Uh, we've got a new version of uh, treatment called PACT, which stands for Personalized Augmented Cognitive Training. We're studying this right now in um, service members and veterans. It's briefer, so it's six sessions, and there also is more choice. So the first session is feedback with a neuropsychologist, and then the next five sessions are chosen by the participant based on their own needs and priorities for treatment. And they can also augment um, that with the Cogsmart app if they like. So that's PACT. We're also studying a new combination of PACT with repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation for post-TBI depression. And then I have a, a bunch of folks who've worked with me who are taking this research forward. Um, uh, Dr. Jackie May has, has um, gotten a VA Career Development Award where she's gonna be focusing on developing booster treatments for individuals with MCI. Uh, Dr. Tara Austin has gotten another VA CDA focusing on uh, CCT for long COVID. Dr. Ryan Van Patten has also got a VA CDA focusing on non-epileptic seizures. Um, Maya O'Neill uh, is completing her VA CDA focusing on CCT for veterans with PTSD. And then my colleague Hedda Hosa in um, South Africa has done some work on, um, on HIV. And finally, I want to shout out uh, to Dr. Rachel Ellison, who's developing some really interesting manuals focusing on race-based stress and discrimination. All right. I know I just have a few minutes left, so I just want to share some uh, more clinical information about how this works in practice for those of you who might want to try it. So the session format is really um, consistent across the sessions. So we start by reviewing the homework from the previous session and talking about how that um, was implemented in daily life. We link that to um, the individual treatment goals. Uh, provide any kind of troubleshooting about the implementation if it didn't go well. And then we introduce the new skills and teach those and practice them and then plan for how to implement those in daily life. And we can always brainstorm ways to remember to practice because that, that is one of the hardest things. This is just a screenshot of the um, perspective memory module. So this is what it looks like. It's got the agenda in the beginning and then um, lays out the rest of the session. They're very straightforward. Uh, I told you before that goals are really important. We start talking about um, psychiatric rehabilitation or psychosocial rehabilitation goals very early on in the first session. And then uh, the facilitator's job is to really get to know those goals well and be able to link the strategies to individual goals. We know that if we're linking all of the things that we're trying to teach to their individual um, rehabilitation goals, that buy-in is massively improved. And so we really want to be consistent in doing that across the intervention. We have the participants do some thinking and writing about how the strategies are gonna be um, connected to their goals. But if they can't come up with the linkage, we will um, provide it. So these are just a few examples of how strategies are linked to goals. Um, let's just pick out the third one. So learning and memory strategies can help you learn and remember new information at home, work, or school. Pretty general. So we've studied a few times um, predictors of outcomes in these interventions. And overall, we find very few moderators, very few uh, predictors of response. We found that comorbid psychiatric symptoms don't moderate response in a TBI population. Um, and a long time ago in a psychosis population, I found that 
folks with worse baseline scores on multiple measures tended to do better in the intervention. Certainly, um, they had more room to improve, and they did. So that really made us feel like we should not be restricting this type of intervention to people with uh, better functioning. So even uh, folks with relatively low functioning can show great improvements. We've studied race, ethnicity, um, other demographic factors many, many times, and we've never found that those predict treatment response. <clears throat> so who's a good candidate for this? Really anyone with a neuropsychiatric disorder who is interested in improving in some of these areas. Um, we have to assume that anyone with a neuropsychiatric illness has either some cognitive impairment or some decline, or maybe isn't using all the strategies that they could. Um, but you may have to build some insight about cognitive functioning and the links between cognition and everyday functioning. A few things that I tell clinicians, um, one is just use the manual as a guide, as a jumping off point, um, feel free to modify it. I love using motivational interviewing in concert with this manual, um, tends to work really well. And also uh, remember to have folks show you what they can do. And also for anyone who uses a smartphone, which is most participants these days, be ready to teach them how to use voice commands to do reminders and calendar functions on um, iOS and Android systems. Um, it's super helpful, big time saver, and gets a lot of people to use their smartphones um, when, when they wouldn't ordinarily um, use them to their maximum capacity. Um, always be open to brainstorming with folks to implement strategies or create new strategies. Um, and certainly if, if people are willing, you can have them augment with either the app or you can show videos from, um, from YouTube as well. Um, this comes up a lot. So sometimes we have participants who say like, oh, I already do all this stuff, or this isn't a fit for me. And I readily admit that they may already use some of these strategies, or maybe even they use a lot of them. But we can usually help the strategies work even better with some coaching. And so I often use this analogy of elite athletes. So even elite athletes can get coaching to improve. Um, and so, so in many cases, there's still room for improvement. And I always tell them, you don't have to use all of these. I'm going to teach them all to you because I want you to have some familiarity. So if you need a strategy down the road, you'll have it. Um, but even if you just learn um, and practice one or two strategies that are really helpful for you, that's a win for us. All right, so I'm going to stop there and I'm going to give you all the Golden Brain Award for listening. So thank you so much. Um, and then I just want to thank uh, all the collaborators whose work I mentioned in this talk. Uh, lots of study coordinators and research assistants and students um, helped with this work. And um, my mentees have just been amazing. So I wanted to give them all a shout out as well, in addition to thanking the participants and the funders of the work. So I've put again um, the websites that you can consult down at the bottom. So cogsmart.com has all the manuals. Um, there are a few manuals that are not online. So if you see something that you want that's not online, just let me know. And um, then my lab website has reports of all the randomized controlled trials posted. So you can get those there. And then I'm the only Twomley at UCSD and the VA, so I'm pretty easy to find, but I put my uh, email addresses as well. So thanks to all of you. I've put some references in there too, and I'm happy to um, PDF this and send it to anybody who would like a copy. Um, and then finally, I did want to plug our um, INS uh, special interest group on neuropsychological intervention. So if you're not a part of that and you'd like to be, um, there's the email address to join. So it's interventionsigmanager at theins.org. 
So I will go ahead and um, I guess I'll probably stop sharing in just a second. I'll just let you copy that email address down if you like. All right, and then we can have some questions. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Kalamli. So we do have um, quite a few questions, which is always the mark of an excellent presentation. Uh, you got a lot of people interested. So uh, our first one is CogSmart applicable to older adults with bipolar disorder and TBI, or does the manual need to be modified? Um, it's it's pretty applicable. And so again, I always tell clinicians like, you know, it's it's just a guide. You don't have to read every single word of it. You can adapt it. You could certainly adapt the psychoeducation portion of it. Um, so the CogSmart one is the TBI manual. And the original um, CCT for psychiatric disorders has a little bit more content that would be relevant to psychiatric disorders, although it's very nonspecific. I don't think it mentions specific symptoms of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or anything like that, um, but it talks about psychiatric illnesses being, being brain disorders. So yeah, you could you could look at both of them and see which one might be better for your specific situation. Um, are the manuals for the motivationally enhanced CCT available on the website? This person was not, interested. But I'm happy happy to send that to to anyone who asks. They're not up yet because we haven't finished the study yet. Perfect. Um, this person was interested in adapting to the geriatric population. Um at an inpatient psychiatric hospital. So do you think that would be a good fit for them? Yes. Um, yeah, there there have been some colleagues at um, Utah State Hospital who have used this in inpatient settings. I think a few other um, inpatient settings, but that's the one that um, has been most in touch with me. So I, I could probably connect you with them and you can get some ideas about um, adaptation ideas that have worked well for them. And also they have a like a slide deck that they use to present. So um, I think they'd be fine with, with sharing that. Awesome. Um, in the clinical setting, what is the optimal number of participants that you might enroll for this group? Yeah, I really like groups of four to six. Um, and so in our studies, when we do group treatments, we actually randomize every six participants. And then um, sometimes you get one or two people that don't stick and that's okay. Uh, but a group of four or six with two facilitators is very manageable. Um, and it tends to be about the right number in terms of not being too classroom-like um, and being a little bit more intimate and encouraging sharing. Makes sense. Um, are there any outcome measures that you can recommend for an individual or group patients in a uh, clinical setting? I mean, it depends on the population that you're working with. And so um, if you're going to be able to measure neuropsychological performance pre and post, um, you know, you obviously can choose the test that you like for that. Um, you know, realizing that the the interventions don't target things like processing speed. So you probably don't want to give 20 processing speed tests, right? So um, just a few, a few neuropsych tests sprinkled in that, that are targeted by the intervention would make sense. We also have um, a cognitive problems and strategies assessment um, that's available on the website. That's kind of a homegrown measure that, um, was really designed to capture the types of cognitive problems and the types of strategies that we teach. Um, but people people have used a variety of, you know, there's the promise cognitive um, self-report measures, um, quality of life measures always seem to show the biggest uh, effect size change. So I like those. Um, and anytime you can measure actual functioning, I think it's important to see if we can move the needle on, on functioning. Mm -hmm. Do you think that similar interventions could be useful for youth with similar conditions? And do you know of any organizations that are implementing similar interventions for younger age groups? Yeah, we've, we've done some studies with younger age groups. So there was one study of um, Latino youth with prodromal psychosis 
Um, they were in the like 12 to 30 ish uh, range, but most of them were teenagers. And we made a few adaptations, um, talked a little bit more about school since that was something that was um, more central in their lives. Um, but but for the most part, the strategies seemed to work pretty well um, in younger age groups as well. We had another study of um, sort of transitional age youth um, with autism, made some adaptations for that group, but not not that many. So um, so I think it works okay. People always ask, like, is there a version for ADHD? And like, no, <laughs> but I think a lot of clinicians use this for clients with ADHD. Um, the folks at Utah State Hospital have also developed an adolescent version, um, and I'd be happy to connect anybody with them as well. Yeah, that would be really appreciated. I know yeah. I would appreciate it. Yeah, um, sure. And then kind of in the same vein, uh, do you think CogSmart can be used with cancer-induced cognitive impairment patients and whether someone could adapt that for a local context, someone who doesn't have English as their native language? This person was uh, specifically talking about South Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there actually, there there is a version in Zosa, which is a language in South Africa. It's the primary, um, there are a lot of languages in South Africa, but Zosa is the primary um, uh, language there. So there is a version that you could adapt. So I could share that. Um, for post-cancer, um, yes, there are some people who are interested in doing this. I just was corresponding with someone last week about this. And um, one of my former trainees, uh, Tanya Pan Weiss at UCSD, um, did end up doing a group at our cancer center and it was very well received. So I think it, it is a good fit for that population as well. Um, I realize we're getting close to time, but we still have a few more questions. So if it's okay with you, could we for go sure. over a few extra minutes? Yeah. All right. Um, this person was wondering if you could speak a bit more to the validity of neuropsychological assessments for the unhoused population or whether you had to adapt any of your measures for this population in any of your studies. Um. We have not adapted measures. Um, we've we've tested folks who are um, either living in a residential uh, mental health treatment facility, so they are sheltered at the time of their testing, um, or they're um, living in a homeless shelter. So we've done work in a couple different settings, and um, we have not adapted the tests. Um, I do think it's important to measure um, performance validity in that population because many folks are trying to obtain disability. And so there's obviously an incentive um, there that you need to, to take advantage of. But also, you know, by definition, this is a functionally impaired population. And we've seen rates of performance in validity that are quite low. Sounds. Um, have you ever found an optimal time to initiate CogSmart with patients who are post TBI, especially with those to with moderate to severe TBI? Yeah, we we have not done this with folks with severe TBI. We've done mild and moderate. And we, in our studies, we tend to get uh, individuals who are in the chronic phase of their TBI. So their TBIs have occurred, you know, many years in the past. Um, once in a while, we get someone who's a little bit more fresh, <laughs> but still they, um, they are typically past their period of expected improvement. So for example, at least three months out from a mild TBI. Um, so I think, you know, you, you don't want to um, you don't want to encourage attribution of cognitive errors to a TBI when when it's not appropriate, right? So you want to educate patients about base rates of cognitive errors in the general population. There's lots of great materials for doing that, and we we have some adapted materials for that that are on the website. Um, but certainly, you don't want to try to convince someone that they have a problem. 
before you know that they have a problem, right? So I, I probably wouldn't do it early in the phase of recovery because we want the brain to have its chance to recover. Um, in a, speaking of uh, brains recovering, I this person was wondering if this would work with stroke patients. Um, could Do you think that you could generalize your TBI findings to uh, stroke patients as well? And yeah. what would your opinion be? Yeah, we, we've never done a study specifically on post-stroke cognitive impairment, but um, a lot of the literature is really on, on mixed acquired brain injury combining um, TBI and stroke samples. Uh, I think it would generalize pretty well. Um, and in the MECCT group that was just wrapping up this week, did you involve any care partners, uh, those with the MCI? Um, we didn't in this particular study. Many of them don't have a care partner, um, but in many of our former studies, we do invite participants and certainly um, clinically, we would invite participants to invite their loved ones to come. Usually we say um, we open that up for the first session and the last session. So we really want um, care partners to understand uh, that cognitive impairment is a real thing. It's not just the person being a jerk, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we also want them to sort of have a have an idea of the types of strategies that we might be covering in in the group or the class um, or the intervention, however we deliver it. And and then we invite them to come back for the last session because we really want to. Um, have the participants talk about changes that they've made. Oftentimes the care partners have a lot to say about certain things that have worked really well for them. And then we also engage them in a conversation about um, planning for future implementation down the road. Um, did you use the CRT for patients with major depressive disorder? Um, how and with which programs? Sorry, the CRT? Yes. This person asked it uh, as the CRT, I think. I think that they actually meant the CCT. Yeah, so, yeah. so mm -hmm. we used CCT in the R01 study that I talked about with people with um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and major depressive disorder. So that was the study where they were all unemployed and seeking work. And yeah, we actually did find a, um, an improvement in depressive symptoms in that study. Um, this person wants to know if there are any Persian, specifically Farsi versions of Cogsmart, or if you are aware of any teams that are working on it. Farsi, um, I would have to double check, but I don't think so. Not yet. There is an Arabic version, and some people who speak Farsi also speak Arabic, but um, I don't think there is a specific Farsi version yet. Right. If there's like someone who wants soon. to translate it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me know. Okay, and then one last question. Um, since we know that most patients with severe TBI do have ongoing cognitive de deficits, do you think that it would be appropriate to attempt a group uh, with patients with severe TBI six months to a year post-injury? You know, there's severe TBI and then there's severe TBI, right? So I think that there's a lot of heterogeneity within that group. Um, it might be hard to do a group with severe TBI because of that. Um, I think individual treatment might uh, be preferable for that particular population. I, I would feel like you could attempt it. You could certainly use some of the strategies, um, some of the more like environmental cues, alarms, things like that are just incredibly helpful. But again, it totally depends on the nature of the injury and the cognitive sequelae. Um, so I think you, you would wanna pick and choose strategies that you thought were um, applicable to the situation and that had a hope of success. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much for oh, your extra so time. Um, and before everyone hops off, I just want to 
remind everyone to join us again for next week when we go over medication options for behavioral symptoms of dementia with Dr. Dylan Wint. Um, that'll be next Monday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, 11.30 uh, a.m. over here on the Pacific time zone. Um, so thank you guys very much for attending, and we'll have our slides up very soon. Thank you again, Dr. Twomley, for this awesome talk. Thank you for having me.